Face at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. It will be here before you know it. The deadline to register to vote in the March 1st primary just over two weeks away now on the 31st. Yeah, as you'd expect, groups who register people to vote are calling, texting, and mailing out reminders. But as you will hear, Jesse DeGoyato tells us why they say their voter registration efforts have now taken on greater significance. I've been having these quiet conversations with the members of Congress for the last two months. I'm tired of being quiet. Groups like Black Lives Matter say it's about time President Biden spoke up in support of federal legislation to counter what they say are voter suppression laws. This needs national attention and it needs presidential attention. Camille Factory of San Antonio was arrested in July in a demonstration supporting the voting rights legislation. Black Freedom Factory, which she founded, is focused on registering voters. It's really important important that voters know that that card is the political autonomy that they have uh, for their freedom, for their voice, and for the future of democracy. Move Texas, which has been registering college students statewide since it began at UTSA, has now mailed out 50,000 voter registration forms. How is this voter registration effort different in terms of significance? Really, there's never been a more important time to be in voter registration or to be a voter. Important enough, he says, that Move Texas took on the state's voter restrictions last year. Young people are really in the forefront of the movement to protect our democracy here in Texas and across the country. 230,000 young men and women in Texas turn 18 every year. The priority now for the group founded by civil rights pioneer Willie Velasquez, the Southwest Voter Registration and Education Project. In Texas, we have always had these challenges. It is not new for us. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. And coming up in the next half hour, we'll tell you about the efforts that President Biden is making for the national voting rights bill. In the city's upcoming $1.2 billion bond proposal inching closer to the ballot. Five separate bond committees made up of council appointees considering which projects should be included in the five-year bond proposal. City Hall reporter Garrett Berger is live right now with what they said during the recommendations to the council. Garrett. Though the committees put forward 182 different project recommendations from fire stations to streets to even housing, they made nearly $45 million in changes from what city council and city staff first put in front of them. However, it was the smallest portion of the bond that became the most common thread in the discussion, though perhaps the most colorful in public arts funding. Now in the last bond program, the city set aside 1% for public arts, apart from the neighborhood improvement section. This time around, the original plan was to set aside 1.5% with the exception of housing. But the Parks Committee suggested cutting their portion of public arts funding back to 1%. The Drainage Committee suggested cutting its art portion out completely. Those cuts, 3.8 million combined, would bring the average public art portion down to about 1.1% to the ire of some art supporters who showed up in council met chambers today. Now, council members had different reactions to the proposed cuts. I think people across the city are saying, yes, we do need to pay more attention to our infrastructure. I want to work with you, Eric Walsh, on how we can find other ways while I'm hesitant to undo things. I want to work with you on seeing how we can find more funding for the arts. City Manager Eric Walsh pointed out there would still be $3.6 million more in this bond for public arts than there was in the last. He also told media members after the meeting that staff would bring council members options on what to do about the public arts funding in the bond. That might include cutting to bond projects, bringing in a different funding source to supplement, or even just concentrating more on the annual budget and the funding for the arts in that. Now, City Council is scheduled to approve the final version of what will be put in front of you, the voters, at its meeting on February 10th. And it will end its way up to, in the ballot box on the May 3rd election. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Well, you know, we've been talking about it for some time, but tomorrow is the day the City Council will vote to approve CPS Energy's rate hike proposal. Remember, it's a two-part increase, a 3.85% increase to the base rate and a bump to the monthly fuel charge. That equals out to around $5 for the average customer. We'll bring you all the latest on that vote tomorrow, and also we'll talk to the mayor about it coming up later in our case at Q&A.
The Red Cross is declaring the first ever blood crisis. A big reason behind it, the surge in Omicron COVID-19 cases. Red Cross officials are calling this the worst blood shortage in over a decade. They say they've seen a 10% decline in donations since the beginning of the pandemic. All blood types are needed right now, but especially types O positive and negative considered the universal donors. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center offers both donor centers and mobile blood drives. For a link on how you can make an appointment, go to ksat.com. Here's the latest COVID numbers in Bear County. 7,704 new cases are being reported. That is up. The seven day moving average now sits at 4,352. That's the seven day average. Three new deaths today, bringing the total to 4,997. Only three away from another grim milestone. As for hospitalizations, 958 people are in the hospital. We're getting close to the 1,000 mark. And 201 people in intensive care, 79 on ventilators. Those numbers also up. Now, seniors are at highest risk for complications due to the COVID virus, but some have figured out how to live with it, even through this latest surge and shortage of tests. Ursula Perry with lessons learned by a group of our most medically fragile. That's about everybody in the house, too. Every hand goes up when you ask this group of Eastside senior citizens who is fully up to date with their vaccines. They meet twice a week at Blessed Angels Community Center ever since COVID started, and their track record against the deadly virus is nothing short of remarkable. One, two, three. But ask how many of them have lost someone in their family to COVID, you get a different answer. Willie Mae Gray is one of them losing her son. He just turned 54 and I just lost him four months ago today. She, like Marty Villarreal, who lost her beloved 29-year-old granddaughter to COVID, are still confused why they survived, but their younger family members have not. She walked into the hospital, but she never came out. These emotional losses have been rolling in for more than a year now, but they credit the center and its social gatherings for keeping them healthy, physically and mentally. It helps me so much being here with all these people. It helps me. Another way that the senior center takes care of its seniors is it has an in-house grocery store. It's been in place for quite a while and it used to be take all you want. Nowadays, because of shortages, though, there are limits. That's our goal to help them as much as we can because they can't get around. And so we try to bring it to them. That goes for boosters too. Everyone is vaccinated, masked. And when the last bingo number is called, everything sanitized by volunteers. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. At this point in the pandemic, there are several medications or therapies available to treat COVID-19, but they're not open to everyone and they're not always easy to find. I talked to Dr. Jan Patterson, a professor and infectious disease physician at UT Health San Antonio. She breaks down what treatments are out there and what you need to know about them, starting with monoclonal antibody infusions. The two that we had the most access to, uh, Regeneron and Lilly, they're no longer effective enough against the Omicron variant. So now there is another, Citrovimab, but there's a shortage of it in San Antonio, and it's typically reserved for people who have a suppressed immune system who are over 65 or at risk for serious COVID symptoms. Then there are pills, Paxlovid from Pfizer. It is that it inhibits an enzyme that's needed for uh, reproduction of the virus. It's been shown to be about 89% effective in decreasing hospitalization and death. It needs to be given within five days of symptoms. It can be given to people as young as 12, but again, usually for people who have other risk factors. Molnupiravir is another pill option. It's for ages 18 and up, but like other treatments available, there are warnings attached. And that's because it has some bone and cartilage toxicity. It's also uh, not recommended in pregnancy, uh, and that's because of the mutations that it can cause. Um, you know, it can cause uh, mutations in human cells also. You might have heard about a medication to prevent COVID. It's an injection called Evashield. Most health systems are limiting the use of that to transplant patients who take immunosuppressive medications and they don't respond fully to the vaccine. Uh, and also cancer patients who are on active chemotherapy. All of these treatments have emergency use authorization from the FDA. The only fully FDA approved treatment is remdesivir, which is used for hospitalized COVID patients. But there has been a study now 
that shows that if you use early remdesivir in outpatients, of course, you have to give, have, find a place to give it IV for three days in a row. Um, but if you can do that, it's, uh, it's 87% reduction in hospitalizations and death. Now, Dr. Patterson says best line of defense, it's still the vaccine. But because remdesivir is fully FDA approved, it's no longer being distributed to those regional infusion centers. That's something that UT Health and local city and county leaders are now asking for, partly because there was a greater supply of remdesivir than some of the other monoclonal infusions or even the pills. The San Antonio police need your help in identifying a man in connection with a fatal shooting near the Riverwalk last month. On December 30th, Leo Cameron was found shot and killed on East Market Street and South Alamo. Still no word on what led up to that shooting. Police say the suspect that you see on the left side of the screen there, he actually ran towards the Riverwalk. Anyone with information asked to contact Crime Stoppers at 210-224-7867. We are learning the name of a man who was fatally hit while crossing Loop 410 on the city's west side. Medical examiners identifying him as 34-year-old Joseph Tudus. Police say that he was trying to run across the road when two different cars hit him. Both of those drivers did stop. They complied with police. They showed no signs of intoxication, according to investigators, and no criminal charges are expected. We move now to some developing stories. A woman in the hospital in what San Antonio police are describing as a drive by shooting. Police responded to the shots fired call about 1030 this morning on Dolores Avenue. That's not far from Calabra. They found the woman with a gunshot to the leg. Four people inside a nearby home were taken in for questioning. So far, police have no description of the vehicle involved or the suspects. A woman had to be rescued from heavy machinery at a food processing plant today. This happened this morning at Andy Garcia Foods on Jackson Keller. Fire crews say the woman was cleaning a mixing machine. That's when she somehow got caught in it from the waist down. Part of that machine was taken off to save her. She was taken to a hospital to be checked out. Boy, this day was almost split in half. It was like a gray morning and a sunny afternoon, Adam Kasky. And the sky was actually split in half, the sun and clouds, and that cloud line just moved southward throughout the day, and we all got into the sunshine. A very average day today, temperature-wise. Morning low of 42, then an afternoon high of 63. The record high today, 81, set back in 2017. Let's take a look at the readings now. Some 60s and 50s, we're getting a mixture out there currently. Bulverde 56, Seguin 61. Stinson 63, Helotus now at 56 degrees. And as we go through the evening hours, temperatures falling off through the 40s. By midnight will be about 45 degrees. Clear sky, calm wind, and of course, cool readings. And a bit of a chill in the air tomorrow. Bandera near freezing, Comfort 33. Canyon Lake about 39, 37 Port SA to start the day tomorrow. And Floresville, 39 degrees. We'll have a bit, bit of a warm up and then another cold front. We'll get into those details in a bit, Steve. Thank you, Adam. The midterm election 10 months away, but efforts are happening right now to make sure Americans voting rights are secured. The latest from Capitol Hill. And it's a street full of international businesses and it's being celebrated today. We have video from that ceremony and explain why this is said to be beneficial to all residents. Welcome back. Now, here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. So we've told you about the surge in COVID-19 cases. We're also seeing a surge in the demand for masks, and they're getting expensive. Now, here's a price tracker. Uh, according to it, this KN95 mask went for about $30 in October. Now, it's almost $80. Also, here's a question for you. Are you still looking for those at-home COVID tests. We know they're hard to find these days, but we did do some legwork and we're going to tell you where you can find those tests and when a local pharmacy expects to receive more stock. Also, earlier in the newscast, we told you about the blood shortage. It's a big problem for our local food bank and some people who rely on it are going into panic mode. Tonight, you're going to hear from an eight-year-old cancer patient in San Antonio who relies on blood donations to stay alive. We're going to see you for those stories and so much more tonight on the Night Beat. All right, thanks, Stephanie. As San Antonio voters are set to consider another major bond issue this year, some of the projects from the last bond are being completed. Sam King joins us now. Sam, one of these is in the fast-growing Brooks area.
That's right, Steve and Myra. The 2017 bond paid for the extension of what's now known as Global Way. That's formerly Lyser Road. The street name celebrates the four international businesses located at Brooks. The ceremony was held today to celebrate that extension. It's a new four lane roadway with new bike lanes and curbs and sidewalks. And officials at Brooks say this is just the beginning. Our plan for the future on this road is to continue extending the road and building more roads on Brooks. Because at Brooks, when we build new roads, we create more jobs and jobs for the people that live around Brooks. Now, ground was broken on this project in January of 2020. Now, the 2017 bond program authorized more than $10 million for road improvements in the Brooks City Bay South New Braunfels Avenue area. So a lot more to come there. Taking a look close uh, to that area. This is a uh, 37 and Southeast military. You see traffic uh, flowing well there on uh, I 37 on the south side this evening. So things flowing pretty well there do have some issues uh, north of uh, Highway 90. Actually, this is uh, improved as we've been on the air here 15 minutes now southbound on 281 12 minutes uh, northbound. Also some slowdowns on 1604 eastbound. 24 minutes now between I-10 and 281 westbound is greatly improved down to 11 minutes. We had a crash at 1604 and bitters. Finally, uh, this uh, just coming in a vehicle fire reported on I-10 and far east Bear County east of 1604. We see those slowdowns. So if you're expecting someone coming in, maybe from Seguin area or other parts of East Bear County or Guadalupe County, they'll run into some delays this evening. Stephen Meyer. Thank you, Samuel. All right, so we've talked about a split day between gray skies and sunshine. Also feels like we're a little bit warmer out there this time today, Adam. Yeah, yesterday we were in the 50s most of the day. Today we made it into the 60s and mid 60s for some of us out there. And it was a pleasant day, actually very close to average for this time of year. And we'll actually be warming up a little bit next couple of days. Thursday and Friday, we're talking 70s. Next cold front hits, though, early Saturday before sunrise. So we'll briefly get into the 70s. Cooler and very windy on your Saturday. We're going to get to all that and more of the details in a moment, but we do have a weather, a weatherversary. I don't want to necessarily say to celebrate because not everybody celebrates these types of uh, anniversaries, you know, a lot of snow. But on this day back in 1985, 13.5 inches of snow at the airport officially in San Antonio. Not only that, an actual anniversary for some that of our viewers. Nice. Yes, Thomas and Betty Rivera. They were married at Our Lady of the Lake University Church on that day. I mean, what? a memorable yeah. anniversary. I mean, yeah. more than it would typically be. Yeah, she wore white and so did the streets. <laughs> <laughs> he almost, if he just stayed out there a few more minutes, he'd match her, right? <laughs> They'd be the same. So congratulations and happy anniversary to you. Uh, 60 degrees right now, dew point at 29. Wind out of the west southwest at five miles per hour. So not much of a breeze and you're not going to notice it until Saturday. We're going to get into that in a moment, but you look across the state. Let's talk temperatures and they're right around 60 degrees. Lubbock 58, Alpine 55, 59 Dallas, 60 Brownsville. Not a big temperature difference north, south or east, east and west. 57 in Uvalde now, 58 Gonzales, 55 in New Braunfels. And let's fast forward to tomorrow morning. We're expecting to get around freezing in some parts of the hill country. I mean, Kerrville about 33, 34, same with Fredericksburg, but there will be some pockets of a light freeze in the hill country. Even Uvalde though, low in the morning, Del Rio 39. Catula as well. So many of us in the upper 30s to start the day tomorrow feeling that chill in the air. Then by the afternoon, we make it well into the 70s, low 70s hill country, mid 70s elsewhere. It wouldn't surprise me if we even hit 80 degrees south of San Antonio. You get on I-35, Pearsall, Dilly, Catula. It wouldn't shock me if you hit 80 tomorrow with a lot of sunshine. But look at our temperature trend. Mid 70s Thursday and Friday. Then down into the upper 50s for the high temperature on Saturday. Same story Sunday. So pretty much all day Saturday is going to be stuck in the 50s as a result of our next cold front that's headed our way. And I want to show you the system that's going to be causing it. It's actually over the Pacific Ocean right now, but locally we had our clouds clear from the north to the south throughout the day today. So it was a gradual clearing process, but it felt good to see that sunshine today. You actually see two systems here in the Pacific and these comma shaped clouds indicate those upper disturbances. We're watching this one here just off the coast of Washington and Oregon. That's our next disturbance right now. It's being blocked by an upper level high over Southern California. That's going to break down, move down into Mexico, open the door for this disturbance that dip in the flow to drop in 
help generate that cold front. Unfortunately, it's going to be a dry system for us. We could use the moisture. Actually, all of Texas could use the moisture, but we're not expecting really any rainfall with it. 80% of Texas in drought and locally, uh, most of the drought is farther south of San Antonio, basically Maverick, Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen counties, but even up into the hill country, particularly Edwards County, stretching even eastward into Kerrville and Comfort area. So we could use it. It's just looking dry for the foreseeable future. And actually, I think the main headline with the next cold front is going to be the wind. Saturday, gusts up to 45 miles per hour. Tomorrow, you're not going to notice the breeze just out of the northwest at 3 to 8. We'll be into the 70s with sunshine. Pretty much the same on Friday. Then on Saturday, 50s most of the day with that gusty north wind. And I am expecting a light freeze once we get into Sunday morning, right around 30 degrees and only making it into the upper 50s. And you see that a lot of sunshine in our forecast. Unfortunately, no shot at rain. We expecting a cedar breeze with that? Absolutely on Saturday. Yeah, boo. Great. Thanks, Adam. Don't like those cedar breezes. Mm. All right, so th as this year has gone so far, there's no such thing as a sure win. But you would hope this is a game that the Spurs would win. Yeah, Rockets are last in the Western Conference. They're not playing very good. And if the Spurs can get some help back tonight, then it should heighten those chances of beating the Rockets. There is a possibility the Spurs can get three players back tonight. And in high school basketball, John Paul II gearing up for a state run coming up. Shorthanded Spurs will host the shorthanded Rockets tonight to open a seven game homestand. It's the first of four regular season meetings between the two sides. San Antonio could be getting some help as well. While Trey Jones and Doug McDermott are listed on the injury report as out due to health and safety protocols. Kelvin Johnson, Devin Vassell and Derek White were all upgraded from out to questionable for the same reason. And Lonnie Walker, the fourth can't wait to get all of his teammates back. I'm very excited. You know, I, I miss my guys on and off the court, being able to talk and joke with them. And, you know, we sure as hell miss them on the court. You know, we have some very key value players, Kelvin, Derek, Devin, Trey, who have played uh, numerous of minutes that played, you know, the way that we played the Spurs way in our chemistry. So, um, you know, I miss those guys. I'm excited for them to get back and, you know, the whole team get back to go. Spurs and Rockets will play ball tonight at 730. Number 19, Texas Tech beat number one Baylor and Waco last night, 65-62, handing the Bears their first loss this season. Tech rallied from a 15-point first half deficit to snap the Bears' 21-game winning streak. After missing two games with an ankle injury, Red Raiders guard and Wagner High School alum Kevin McCuller returned to score 12 points with six rebounds and five assists. He's less than 100% and still helped the Red Raiders stun the Bears. It was definitely a big win, probably one of my, yeah, for sure, one of my biggest wins in my career here at Tech. And, um, you know, I'm just glad I did it with these guys and Coach Adams. And, um, you know, it was just an amazing feeling, and they're a really good team. And, um, you know, respect to them. McCuller said he didn't know if he was going to play, but his ankle felt good during shoot-around, so he gave it a go. In boys basketball, John Paul II Catholic High School is chasing the state championship and they have the talent to do it. Led by head coach Forrest Blackwell, the Guardians are trying for a district championship three-peat as well. Coach has a roster of eight seniors and four juniors. Senior point guard Desmond Dudley leads the way to 15 points per game. Senior center Matthew Cuellar is averaging 14 points per and senior guard Peyton Reimer is third at 13 points per contest. Coach says the injury bug hit them in late December, causing them to lose four starters. Now the guard Guardians are 11 of 14 overall and 1 and 0 in taps for a district three. Their non-district schedule was brutal, facing bigger schools like Judson, Steele, and Wagner, just to name a few. Coach had them play 6A and 5A teams for a reason. It's a scary situation um, for those who've never done it before because you don't want to hurt your team's morale. You don't want to bring back the image of your team, all right? And you don't want to give other teams reason to think there's weakness in your armor um, or that you're not as good as you think you are. But I mean, we stood toe to toe with some of the best, man, some respectable coaches, some respectable teams um, throughout the state, uh, not only in TAPS, but UIL as well. It helps us a lot because it gets us prepared for what we got to face and what we really want to make make the run that we want to make. So it's actually just, I'm just glad that we got to be able to com compete against those schools and just be able to show out and do what we do best. It doesn't look good like on, the, on like a sheet, like you see like losses, but I feel like we've like made growth. This is the first time like this, 
this type of like level is played at like six A's and stuff like that. So, so I think like if you look at it, it's like losses, but I think we've like grown. I feel that we can go a 10 and 0, but every, every team's gonna give us their best. We're the game that they mark on the schedule every year. They're ready to take our try to take our top spot in district, and I think we can keep it and go 10 and 0. John Paul too won their Taps district opener last night versus Holy Cross, 84 to 38. That's a good debut, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, not, not too shabby. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Our KSAM Q and A is up next. What is happening in the city and is there concern that the rise in the cases that we're seeing in COVID could impact city services? We are joined as we are on most Wednesdays by San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg joins us live from his office. Mr. Mayor, when we see a number like more than 7,000 cases that we saw just today, can we put, do we need to put that in some sort of context when we're talking about just how contagious the Omicron variant is? I think context is always extremely important, and, and the Omicron variant is the most highly contagious variant that we've seen throughout this pandemic. That much is clear. Uh, we are cautiously hopeful that the data will bear out that uh, the cases are perhaps a little less severe. But the big message for us um, to continue to drive home is the fact that you can avoid serious illness and hospitalization by making sure that you're vaccinated, that you're boosted, that you're you know, practicing the safe behaviors like masking up uh, where appropriate and proper sanitation, that remains true. But the Omicron variant is very highly contagious. That's why you've seen the case numbers skyrocket. And you've also seen the positivity rate uh, skyrocket. And that's true across the country and even in Texas where um, in Dallas County, for instance, a couple of weeks ago recorded a 48% positivity rate. So we're seeing things that we had not seen before uh, in the earlier phases of this pandemic. You know, throughout the pandemic, the overall message has been that typically older people, adults, they tend to get the more serious illness. And when it comes to kids, the youngest people who can get vaccinated five and up, we have a pretty low vaccination rate in our community. So how big of a concern is that for you and any of the other health experts that you're talking to? Well, that and we, uh, the judge and I convened the superintendents today to talk about that and the importance for us to get the message to families that our five to 11 year old population, which was the last to become eligible with the vaccinations, still has a lot of room to improve. Um, and we know those students are back in school. And so to protect them, uh, we need to make sure that they're getting vaccinated. So if you have, if you are a parent of a child who's between five and 11, uh, you are eligible for the vaccine and you should go get it to protect them uh, in the school setting to make sure that, again, they're not uh, at further risk for for severe infection. Um, but yes, uh, the the other trends that we saw, the other data points that we saw earlier in the pandemic are still bearing out. Uh, this uh, virus still attacks uh, underlying conditions. So um, and, and also uh, folks who are older, who are more um, immune compromised, perhaps are at higher risk for severe infection. But uh, again, we need to get folks vaccinated, particularly those kids who just became vaccinated a few months ago. And we've got a lot of room to improve there. I know when we talked last week, you had some concern about how such a highly contagious variant like Omicron could affect police, fire, even basic city services, city departments. Are you seeing that play out? Are you still concerned about that? I am concerned about that, uh, just as we are in the hospitals and maintaining st strength of staff there uh, and the challenges of um, you know, increasing patient loads and, and also nurses and, and healthcare professionals themselves coming up positive uh, and getting sick. Uh, we've got to make sure that we have essential services taken care of in the city uh, and throughout our public sector. Uh, I will tell you that um, the Omicron variant has also hit city staff uh, and emergency personnel. And so we have seen staff ranks suffer, um, but it has not affected the delivery of city services. Thankfully, not yet. Uh, we've seen a little bit of a drop in the number of positive cases this week compared to last. But we are we are very close uh, to the in fact, we are at the highest numbers we've seen in terms of infections among employees and we've got to watch that very carefully to make sure that it doesn't impact 
uh, city services. I, I will also say that we're making preparations in the event that we do have to shift uh, shift some of the load, the, the rebalance some of the city services. Um, but thankfully, we have not had to do that yet. We are preparing for that event, but we're trying to prevent it from happening. We want to switch gears here to the vote expected tomorrow on the CPS uh, energy rate increase. The city council taking up that issue tomorrow during council meetings. Are you expecting that to pass? Will that be approved? And if so, what's your message to everyone who will then be paying that rate increase? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I will say, um, like you, uh, I am a, a CPS rate payer. We are all CPS rate payers. We are also all owners of the utility. And for us to get the service that we expect from that utility as a public utility, we've got to make sure that we're providing the resources. We have asked CPS to whittle down their rate adjustment request to the very essentials needed to make sure that we are addressing weatherizations, resilience, making sure that we're keeping up with the infrastructure maintenance. And they have done that, and that's why they've reduced the request uh, to below 4%. So uh, I do expect it to pass because I think everyone, um, no one wants to adjust the rates uh, ever. We haven't done that in eight years, but we also recognize the reality that we have to provide our public utility the resources necessary to deliver the services that we require. Yeah, it's interesting because you, you bring up the fact it's now below 4%. At one point, there was talk of maybe a 10% uh, increase right. on CPS energy bills. So just a little more context to begin and end this conversation with Mayor Ron Nuremberg. As always, appreciate your time. Thanks so much, y'all. Stay safe. You too. We'll be right back. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, just a few uh, issues out there. We'll start here in Eastern Bear County. We had a vehicle fire reported uh, earlier uh, this hour, and that's still causing some delays. So 16 miles per hour, I-10 westbound approaching 1604. Also, some issues on 410 on the uh, northwest side now. We had a crash uh, right there at I-10 and uh, Loop 410. So 13 minutes on 410 westbound, only four minutes the other way from I-10 to 281. So that gives you an idea of the delay. And we have a little bit of a look at that here. This is a uh, loop 410 at Jackson Keller. You can see uh, some of the slow traffic uh, in that area. So uh, watch out for that. Also some construction as always in loop 1604. You can find out more about that online. Actually, let's take a look at that area just to give you an idea. This is 1604 at Hausman. There'll be some alternating lane closures here beginning at nine o'clock. And we'll be right back with more news after this. A lot of people say December the most wonderful time of the year, but some say it is Girl Scout cookie season. <laughs> and that joyous time is upon us. This year you can get your favorites like always, but you also have a new option called Adventurefuls. The Girl Scouts website describes those cookies as, quote, an indulgent brownie inspired cookie with caramel flavored creme and a hint of sea salt. So fancy, Steve. I know. Well, last that's what it's <laughs> had a little accent. So. All right. So last year's edition, the French toast inspired toastier is also still available. The creme de la creme An order of Girl one. Scout cookies. They've got around the newsroom. Yeah. Now I want some. All right. Let's switch over to weather. And, uh, you know, it's been kind of chilly. Today was much better. <laughs> yeah, and today was warmer. We made it into the 60s this afternoon, and actually the day was pretty much average for this time of year. It's what you would expect, basically. 42 in the morning, 63 by the afternoon. Both of those really close to the averages. And you take a look at the highs across our area. Del Rio, just about 70, making it to 69. Same with Pleasanton and Catula. Those were the warm spots. But even Kerrville made it to 65 today. So even the hill country representing some comfortable temperatures out there. You look at our morning readings in the days ahead. Sunday's going to be our low point. That's when we're back down to 30 degrees. So one day there where we think we'll have a brief light freeze. And again, that's Sunday morning. So let's talk temperatures and what's headed our way. Right now we're mostly in the 50s. 55 Pleasanton, 54 Uvalde, New Braunfels and Gonzales at 55. And Temperatures across the state are actually very similar as well. I like to show you the big picture to let you know how cold the air is that's headed our way, and it's really not that cold, especially compared to what we've had lately. It's above freezing. Minneapolis to Bismarck to Casper and even on into Montana 
temperatures are actually above freezing and there is some cooler air in Canada that's going to plunge southward, but this isn't the bitter Arctic air that's pushing south. So it's just a colder air mass or cooler air mass that's going to clip us this upcoming weekend. So we'll go from the 70s tomorrow and Friday down into the upper 50s for highs Saturday and Sunday. So yes, noticeable for sure, but it's not that bitterly cold air that we can sometimes see this time of year. It's just not the case. And again, a brief freeze Sunday morning before we make it to near 60 by the afternoon. Actually, I think with that next front, the wind is going to be the primary headline. It's been pretty much calm the past couple of days right now. Not much of a breeze out there. It's five miles per hour at the airport in town and you're not going to notice the wind tomorrow. Friday, some gusts about 10 to 15 miles per hour. Saturday, though, the cold front hits before sunrise and that's when the wind ramps up. I mean, you're going to notice this cold front when it hits primarily because of the gusty winds that are going to hit us right away. We're talking some wind gusts around 45 miles per hour for the first half of our weekend. Here's a big picture in terms of what's happening and what's going to cause that cold front to move through. Actually, we're watching this swirl, this pinwheel in the atmosphere uh, over the Pacific Ocean, just about making its way on shore here in Vancouver area, Seattle and Portland. That's the upper disturbance that's going to be dropping southward. Right now it's blocked by the upper level high over Southern California, but that's going to move down over Mexico and it's going to open the door for that upper low. Sometimes these drop into Texas and they give us good rain potential. Unfortunately, that's not the case here and our sunny and dry trend is going to continue. So a cool morning tomorrow at 39 by the afternoon. We make it up to 74. Nothing but sunshine and just a light northwesterly breeze at about three to eight miles per hour. Del Rio, Catula, Crystal City closer to 80 degrees, upper 70s right near 80 and along the Gulf Coast we will be in the mid 70s tomorrow. Friday we do it all over again. 42 in the morning, 76 in the afternoon, Saturday before most of us wake up. That's when the front hits wind gusts of 45 miles per hour and temperatures in the 50s pretty much all day long, but topping out around 58 and then Sunday that light freeze in the morning near 30 degrees and then close to 60 in the afternoon and you see nothing but sunshine and no rainfall potential or percentages on the seven day anytime soon. 45 mile per hour gusts on Saturday mm. wouldn't surprise me if we saw a few even a little higher than that. Wow. wow. Yeah, thanks Adam. All right, up next, a look at the White House efforts to get the National Voting Rights Bill passed and how that could include a Senate policy change. Up next. President Biden continuing his push to pass voting rights legislation and today announcing that he will sit down with Senate Democrats to discuss how to pass that legislation. Now that's despite op facing opposition from two members of his own party to get that done. Yeah, ABC's Ike Ajochi is in Washington with more. President Biden plans to meet with Senate Democrats Thursday to try and unlock the negotiations on voting rights that have been stalled by members of his own party. Tuesday, the president saying he wants to eliminate the filibuster for voting rights, calling on his fellow Democrats to act. Every senator, Democrat, Republican and Independent, want to declare where they stand, not just for the moment, but for the ages. If you want to be on the side of John Lewis, or Bull Connor. Republicans remaining firm in their opposition to any change in the Senate rules, claiming the president's speech failed to unify Americans. Yesterday, he shouted that if you disagree with him, you're George Wallace. George Wallace. Democrats vowing to move forward. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying the work is not easy, but he continues to engage with moderate Democratic holdouts Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin. Trying to come to a place where 50 senators can support two bills, the Freedom to Vote Act and uh, the John Lewis Act. Still, no agreement has been reached. Congressional Democrats facing pressure from voting rights advocates who say there's an assault on the right to vote. 19 states have passed restrictive voting laws in the wake of former President Trump's lies about his election being stolen, many of them targeting early voting. And new data from the Brennan Center for Justice reveals many candidates for top state election administration roles are fundraising at a record pace, with some of the biggest hauls going to candidates who've made denying the results of the 2020 presidential election a central focus of their campaigns. 
The White House says the president and vice president will be working the phones over the next several days, pushing members of the Senate to support changes to the filibuster. Ike Ajachi, ABC News, Washington. I have a new uh, crash reporter here. This is uh, the northeast side, I-35 southbound at Randolph. So you see some uh, people in the red there, eight miles per hour approaching that. So keep that in mind if you're on the northeast side uh, this evening. Think getting a little better there on uh, Loop 410 westbound to 81 to I-10. 12 minutes now, still a slowdown there as you approach the intersection with I-10. Four minutes the other way. Here's a look at that area, 410 in Jackson Keller, Adam. And tomorrow, Sam, a bit of a chill in the air. We'll be mid to upper 30s in the morning. Then by the afternoon, warm, mid 70s. Nothing but sunshine. Friday, very similar. Cold front hits early Saturday. No rain with it, even not much in terms of clouds either. Just some cooler temperatures in the 50s on Saturday and gusty winds up to 45 miles per hour. Then a light freeze into Sunday morning. Notice how temperatures rebound pretty quickly into next week as well. Nice couple of days ahead. Thanks, Adam. And thank you for watching the news at 6. See you back here on the night beat at 10.